thank you for joining us for this live conversation on COVID-19. As I'm sure you've seen, there have been many headlines about COVID-19 in the past few weeks, about boosters, about vaccine eligibility. So who better to talk about all of this than our Chief Infection Prevention Officer, Dr. Marcy Dries. Dr. Dries, thank you so much for joining us today. Good morning, Megan. Good to have, good, thanks for having me back. So if you have any questions for Dr. Dries during this conversation, please put those comments in the comment section below this video here on Facebook, and we will try to get to them throughout our conversation. Dr. Dries, let's start big picture. What do the COVID case numbers look like in Delaware and the surrounding area right now? So I think as everyone's aware, you know, the country as a whole saw a huge Delta surge um, over the late summer, early fall. And a lot of that was being driven by states with lower vaccination rates, uh, largely in the South and Southeast. Um, and they had a very high spike and then a, a pretty rapid decline uh, since. Now, Delaware and Pennsylvania and New Jersey and, and Maryland um, had higher vaccination rates. And so we were not hit as hard by that Delta surge. Um, and so we, we really did kind of flatten the curve. So we saw a much more gradual and lower peak, but we've also really been kind of plateaued for the last few weeks. And we're just now starting to see a decline in new cases and hospitalization. So we're, we're moving in the right direction. It's just more slowly than, than those states that saw the, you know, the, a really severe surge. So moving in the right direction for cases, what about vaccination rates? So I think, you know, again, we've we've done better than many states, not as well as others, uh, as far as getting as many people vaccinated as possible. Um, I think more than 1.2 million doses have been administered. Um, if you look at the population 18 and above, 81% uh, have gotten at least one dose. Um, if you look at the total population, however, about 62% have gotten one dose and 55% are fully vaccinated. Um, if you look at the 65 and older who were, you know, really targeted with vaccine uh, from the beginning, you know, they're 90% fully vaccinated. So it does vary quite a bit by age. We definitely have room to, to go, but um, we're not doing too well. So we have first dose, second dose, and now we're talking about boosters. And over the past few days, both Moderna and Johnson & Johnson have been approved for boosters. Lay all of that out for us. How do those three vaccines differ for boosters? So Pfizer had gotten approved uh, last month um, when they applied and they showed that they had some declining immunity after about six months. And so that, that has been in place. And there was a gap, though. What about people who had gotten Moderna or J&J? &J? So that, those gaps were just filled this past week with now all three uh, manufacturers are approved to have boosters. Um, for Pfizer and Moderna, they are both recommended for six months or later after your second dose. Um, for Johnson & Johnson, it's recommended two months or later after your single dose. Um, and then, you know, the, otherwise, they're the same vaccines as you got initially. Um, the only difference is that Moderna is half the dose as it was, as was the initial series. And that's because that was actually a higher dose vaccine to begin with. And so they tested that and they found that a, a lower dose was just as effective in terms of generating an antibody response. And so hopefully with fewer side effects given the lower dose. So the CDC has approved mixing and matching these vaccines for the booster. What does that mean? So, you know, when we first roll these out, you know, we are very uh, clear that if you started with Moderna, you need to get both your first and second doses of Moderna, similar with, with Pfizer. And that is still the case. For the primary series, you still really want to get both doses from the same manufacturer, unless there's a, a circumstance where you absolutely can't get one or the other. Um, but what everyone was asking for was having a little bit more flexibility. So, you know, particularly when not, not everyone can get to every location. Um, you know, if you're in a nursing home, you may only have one available and it may not be the same one that you were vaccinated with initially. So uh, the CDC really felt that, you know, given the data that we have, um, they all appear to be effective, mixing and matching them seems to be safe. Um, and so they wanted to maximize flexibility. So. What that means is that if you got Pfizer, you can get Pfizer again, you can get, or you can get Moderna, or you can even get J&J &J if you want, likewise uh, with any of the others. Um, with J&J, &J, you know, if you uh, got J&J &J initially, you may get a better short-term antibody boost by getting one of the mRNA vaccines. However, you know, J&J &J has not seen the decline over time uh, in your immunity that the others have been. So, so whether switching it up is gonna give you, you know, a similar effect long term, you know, that we don't yet know because we just haven't had enough time to follow it. So we've been seeing questions across the Christiana Care social platforms since this booster information has come out about, you know, who really should be getting the boosters. And 
And some people are asking if I'm, if I'm young and healthy and I'm not immunocompromised, should I get it just to get it or, or maybe wait? What would you say to those, that population? Yeah, so again, it depends on which vaccine you got. So if you got J and J, everyone is recommended to get a booster two months or later, because we know that that initial efficacy was not as high. It was only about 70% compared to over 90% for the mRNA vaccines. But when you when they got a second J and J booster, that boosted it up to 94%. So if you really want to maximize your protection, you want to get your booster there. For the, the two uh, mRNA vaccines, they kind of divided into four groups. So the two groups that are definitely recommended to get a booster are people 65 and older, because we know they're at higher risk for um, declining immunity as well as severe COVID and hospitalization and death, and as well as people that are 50 to 64 who have a variety of underlying health conditions. Again, because they're at risk for severe COVID should they get it. The second two groups are people that may consider getting a, vac a booster. They don't have to, that they wanna weigh their individual risks and benefits. So that is people younger than 50 with underlying health conditions, and then people who are at increased risk of exposure to COVID. So that's healthcare workers, other frontline workers, people who live in a homeless shelter or, or um, uh, you know, uh, prison, stuff like that. So those are people though where it's a little bit more optional. So again, you know, the young, otherwise healthy person that doesn't have one of those occupations, you know, they may want to, to wait um, and just see how it, how it plays out. Um, we have seen more waning with Pfizer than with, with Moderna. So. Um, Moderna seems to be holding out a little bit longer. So I would, I would feel more comfortable waiting if I had gotten Moderna than, uh, than for Pfizer. And then there's the population that we, you know, here at Christiana Care have been trying to reach since the start of COVID, the, the pregnant population and the yeah. importance of that population getting all vaccines, not necessarily yeah. just COVID. What is your message to those pregnant women who haven't even gotten vaccinated at all yet? And then the ones who are weighing getting that booster? Yeah, so pregnancy, you know, it's it's unfortunate that pregnant women are typically excluded from clinical trials, and that's not just vaccines, that's really everything. And so then there's that uncertainty, like, is it safe? And, and I think we now have an abundance of data that says that it is safe. And this comes from animal studies, from our observational studies, from people who got pregnant um, in the studies, you know, and, um, and it, it appears to be abundantly safe in pregnancy to get vaccinated. And importantly, pregnant women are at really high risk of COVID. Um, and they're, they're at high risk of all respiratory infections because you, know, you are relatively immunosuppressed. Plus, you, know, you have a big baby there, you can't breathe as well, your lungs get a little compressed. So you're at, at super high risk, especially as the pregnancy progresses of having severe COVID or severe flu and being in the ICU and dying. And, and actually August, you know, we saw more deaths in pregnant women in August na nationally than we ever have in this pandemic. So it is really critical that pregnant women get vaccinated. They will pass their immunity onto their baby, help prevent that, um, help protect them as well. Um, and they should also get boosters. So if you're, say you're a healthcare worker and you got vaccinated back in January and now you're pregnant, you know, you are at, you are at risk of you're having your immunity wane um, and being at risk uh, due to your pregnancy. So, so go ahead and get that boost now. Absolutely. Let's shift gears to an even to a younger population. Yesterday, FDA is now looking to approve uh, the Pfizer vaccine for that younger population. It'll go to the CDC next week. What is your opinion on that? What do we look like with the vaccination of kids five to 11? Well, so, you know, we know that kids overall have been relatively spared with severe COVID compared to older adults, especially the, the, the more elderly adults. However, a lot of that equation changed with Delta. So we saw more hospitalizations uh, during July, August, September in kids than we ever have. Um, and actually, so more than, you know, so we think, you know, we think that it's a relatively low risk, but it is definitely not zero. You know, more, almost 2 million kids aged 5 to 11 have gotten COVID that we know of, and many more, I'm sure, that just were never tested because they had mild or asymptomatic disease. More than 8,300 have been in the hospital. And if a kid is in the hospital with COVID, there about one third of them will be in the ICU. Um, and so, you know, there is a significant risk there that, you know, and, and the problem is it's, it's very random. So just because your kid is healthy, doesn't have any underlying health conditions, does not mean that they're gonna be one of the kids that, that gets severe COVID. Um, and then the other thing we always worry about is, you know, even if you have a mild or asymptomatic case, you, uh, kids can still get long COVID. So just progress, long, uh, 
long duration of symptoms that obviously can in, impact their learning, their ability to go to school. Um, and then MISC, multi-system inflammatory syndrome of children, actually the five to 11 group is the highest risk of getting MISC. And that often, again, can be after a mild case. Um, and most of those kids are hospitalized, you know, two thirds of them end up in the ICU and about one to 2% of them die. So, you know, every one of those is a tragedy. And if we, you know, we can prevent any more of that from happening, then we certainly want to do so. So in the meantime, that five to 11 population, I'm sure is very much looking forward to this weekend, Halloween, trick-or-treating and the rest of the upcoming holidays. How can parents make sure they're keeping their children safe while they wait for that fully approved vaccine? Well, the nice thing about Halloween is that it's a largely outdoor activity. Uh, people are outside trick-or-treating, so that's relatively safe based on what we know. We know a lot more now than we did last Halloween in terms of the safety of being outdoors. Um, if you know, we still want to avoid more crowded situations, crowd, certainly crowded indoor settings. Um, if you do have to be indoors in close proximity to people, you know, having a mask that's kind of incorporated into your costume, you know, the the mask that costs the masks that come with costumes certainly do not protect against COVID. And you don't want to wear a cloth mask underneath your costume mask because that could make it difficult to breathe. Um, and of course, you we don't put cloth masks on kids under two. Um, but other than that, you know, kids can go out, be outside, enjoy, you know, get get their candy, you know, obviously, you know, be safe otherwise in terms of, you know, being visible and, and not running across the street in front of cars and that sort of thing, but it should be a fun holiday. And I can't have you here talking about COVID without also talking about the flu. As you know, we are in the middle of flu season. How do you think this flu season may differ from last flu season? Well, last flu season was non-existent, so which none of us predicted. Um, but I think you know all the all the measures that were in place. You know, schools were were largely closed or virtual or or hybrid. Um, people weren't traveling as much. You know, a lot of more of the masking requirements were in place. A lot of that is gone now. So we are not expecting the same sort of flu season this year as we did last year. Um, we haven't seen any flu yet in Delaware, but we have. It has been detected in in some other states. Um, and so now certainly is the time to get vaccinated so that you're well protected against the flu when it does uh, start to arrive in Delaware. Um, and between the, you know, the COVID boosters and the 5 to 11, you know, you can get your flu vaccine at the same time as a COVID vaccine, you know, typically in, in two different arms, ideally. Um, or you can get it, you know, days apart. It doesn't have to be, you know, separated out anymore. And in terms of who should get the flu vaccine, Everybody, kind of everybody. Yep. Yeah. Everybody six months and older. So there is yet no flu vaccine for under six months. Um, and so making sure that anyone caring for an infant that's uh, that age uh, is vaccinated is really critical to prevent them because they they do, you know, young infants are among the high risk uh, for severe. Flu. So we want to protect them as much as possible. And again, that goes back to getting women vaccinated during their pregnancy so that they can pass those antibodies on to their baby. Absolutely. And, you know, a lot of people seem confused and I think probably for a good reason. Do I have potential COVID? Do I have the flu? Do I have a cold? How are we really telling the difference between any of this right now? It's really hard. So um, there are very few symptoms that are specific for one or the other. So the one thing that's a little bit more specific for COVID is the loss of taste and smell. We don't typically see that with flu or with a common cold, um, but it, m many people with COVID don't get that. Um, and particularly now that a lot of people are vaccinated, the symptoms can be pretty mild. So you may have just, you know, some runny nose, some sore throat, and don't have the fever, don't have the, the severe, you know, body aches and headache that, that people were experiencing before they were vaccinated. So it can be really hard to tell. And the, the only way to tell really is to get tested. Um, and we are, you know, there will be, obviously, we'll continue to do COVID testing. And then at least in the hospital setting, we'll be offering, you know, flu, combined flu, COVID, testing so that we can differentiate the two. You know, we have good treatments for flu. So um, whether you're tested positive for flu or just highly suspected to have flu, um, there are antivirals and there, there are other specific treatments for COVID uh, coming down the pike or um, currently available that, you know, if you know you have COVID, you can actually get treated to prevent some of the severe outcomes. So we certainly want to try to know which one is which if we can. And what is your recommendation for community testing of COVID? You know, if you think you may have been exposed or maybe just preventative testing. Well, I think, you know, people should have a pretty low threshold, like I said, to be tested. So, because again, you know, especially if you've been vaccinated, 
the, the symptoms can be pretty mild and, and hard to tell. Um, certainly, if you're at, if you're in an occupation where you're at high risk of exposure all the time, just getting regular testing, even without symptoms, is also uh, not a terrible idea. I know a lot of the schools are offering that, just testing kids once a week, just to make sure. Um, so, you know, and I know testing availability sometimes is, is a challenge, but um, you know, certainly trying to get tested if you have symptoms, and then you know, if you're at otherwise high risk, because um, the last thing you want to do is, you know. If you're if you know you're exposed and then you go off and, and continue on your life, you know, and, and then end up exposing others, you know, one of those people that you expose could be a high risk person to have severe sequelae. So, you know, if we can prevent that by testing you and then putting you in isolation, you know, that's what we want to do. So before I let you go, Dr. Dries, what is your main takeaway message to the community watching this right now? Well, you know, I think we're starting to see, you know, again, Delta seems to be in decline. Um, we don't really know what's hap what's going to happen this fall. You know, so far COVID has been very unpredictable. Uh, flu is always unpredictable. So I think, you know, getting fully vaccinated if you haven't yet, getting your booster if you're eligible, certainly getting your flu shot, you know, everyone kind of needs to, to, to come together to, um, to protect, you know, not only themselves individually, but their their friends, their family, and and the 